Hello and welcome to Rights and Recourse, a program that tackles legal issues, bringing you information and analysis. My name is Dumila Mateza. Remember, you can also be part of our discussion today by tweeting us at Rights Recourse or calling our studio line on 011-714-5497 or 5498. Alternatively, emailing your thoughts to Rights and Recourse about this program and many others, Rights and Recourse at sabc.co.za. In a comment penned down by Songa Zozibi, editor of the Daily Business newspaper, he says, and I quote, the incarceration of the Abba Tembu King, Bielekaya Dalinyebo, following his conviction on charges of assault, arson, and kidnapping, has opened up a discussion about the mooted conflict between the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa and customary law. In another comment on this matter, Tami Kaplahi, in an article published in a Sunday newspaper, says the travesty of the conquest and relegation into insignificance of African customary law has been brought to stock, brought to stock uh, public attention. Today on Rights and Recourse, we examine this dichotomy, a, a real clash between customary law and the Constitution. To discuss this topic in the studio here with me, we are joined by advocate Menzi Similane, who is a legal expert. We'd also like to welcome Mr. Paul Ngobin, who is a constitutional law expert from Lakiteki Shoatoni Incorporated. We're also joined by Ms. Brenda Wardle, Chief Operating Officer from the Wardle College of Law. And lastly, online from Tata, we are joined by our SABC reporter, Ms. Zimkita Mangninana. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recourse. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Zimkita, let me start with you. I wonder if you can give us a background to where we are, probably start after the Supreme Court of Appeal judgment. Well, yes, Dimele, um, the King has started a lot, has uh, actually tried a lot of other means uh, to uh, get away from his 12 year jail sentence, uh, only stating that uh, he performed these uh, uh, crimes while trying to discipline the people of Kelaka. He was not actually uh, taking part on a personal uh, uh, stance, but rather a corrective measure. And these people were accused by other people in the, in the village of Kelaka as being rapists and also one of them was uh, accused for killing a woman in that village. So he's always been saying why he made his uh, appeal in the Constitutional Court and in the Supreme Court of, of Appeal that he should not be given a torture sentence because he was not uh, acting out of criminality rather as a corrective measure. But despite his uh, attempt of putting forward traditional law and with traditional law experts assisting him, that didn't uh, assist him because finally he was given the verdict to go straight to court and he, and he finally handed himself over on the 30th of December as he has now started his talk to sentence. Zimkita, before we go to the customary law and traditional court, the, the issue I want to know, did anybody in you following the trial, anybody raise the issue as to where, were the, uh, where are the other accomplices who did all these deeds with the king? Well, that is the exact issue that the king has been saying. He, uh, he did not perform some of his uh, crimes himself, but uh, the reason why he was charged because he instructed his judges who had no authority to, to not to follow his instructions. That's why the judges were put upon him. So he had to uh, take it up because he's the one who instructed the people to torture the houses, to kidnap the people that were taken from Telaha village, and ultimately another boy uh, who was, so was, uh, died in the process. However, when the matter was brought before the Supreme Court of Appeal, that uh, three-year sentence for uh, capable homicide was then set aside and his sentence reduced from 15 years to 12 years. So it's been a very confusing trial, Daniela, because he has been saying that I did not do some of these things. I just instructed the people, my subjects, to do it. And the reason why it was a collective measure for people who were ill-disciplined in the community of Talaha. So it's been an issue that he has been put forward and backward uh, within the trial, but it did not see any recognition until the LEC. The house of the, the of the of the of the of the Tembu tribe, the royal house, is divided. You have two factions: one that is with the king, and the other factions that is uh, 
or standing aside that is led by the Mtikrakas, part of the some of the Mtikrakas. Is the, are these issues being re so, sorted out that these houses must speak with one voice? There's actually three factions now, Dimele. Oh, three? Because, yes, there's three now. Recently, there's been three. Uh, first of all, it was just the two factions. One faction which was pro king and the second one, which was uh, the uh, one led by Dalit Lumen Tihaha, who has been saying all the time that the king must step down because there were these charges that were hanging over his head. He also um, has written letters to even the office of the presidency, asking the president to withdraw the certificate of recognition for the king. However, even that attempt did not assist him. As the president sent a letter back to King Lilika, he said the reason why he should not be dethroned as the king of other kingdom. And he, he actually wrote that to the, to, the, I mean, to the president, and he continued being the president of other kingdom until the day where he handed himself over. Now, you wonder why there is a third section. The king in October uh, sat down with chiefs and his family and uh, discussed who would succeed him. And that's where he nominated as an his eldest son to take over once he handed himself over to Wellington Prison. However, we have since been told that since the incarceration of the king, the king has since changed his mind from Azenati being his successor. And uh, there are reports that his wife now, Queen Nogwanda, might take the fear and leave the mission of other people. This is now when we saw a good forming, uh, because since I think that meeting has since split from the siblings of, of, of King Yelekaya and causing now a third section. They are saying that they will not change from Azanati and will continue with Azanati as this was announced to the entire Abatem nation. Meanwhile, the siblings who were told to, to reverse Azanati's name are now going with a name that they will release uh, uh, at the end of today in a meeting that's sitting in Lumba in a great place. So there's been that confusion, despite the, the, the legal part that has been taking place to Mila in court and the king's incarceration, the subject, the subject of our termination are also confused who to follow, seeing that there are three groups who are raising three names to take over from the king. Now the, the fear has since been abandoned since the 30th when the king handed himself over to King. What is the role of Tadukolo Dalinyebo in this thing? Tadukolo... Uh, Tango Kolo Dalingebo is, uh, no, in fact, I think we were saying in Tandeni. In Tandeni. In Dalingebo is uh, the only brother of Lielakaya Dalingebo from the Great House. His name has been put forward by the Dalitium of Faction, saying that they think someone who should take the spear is someone who comes from the Great House. And in that Great House, there were only two sons which are Miele Kaya Dalinga who has been incarcerated, and the second person is in Tandini. So they are saying that as a Nazi cannot take over, and while in the great house, there is still someone there. However, the as a Nazi who has announced that they came uh, to take over, uh, his name is since been withdrawn. We don't know whether the meeting that's sitting today at Luma Nikolai will finally uh, confirm reports that have been going around that Queen Nogwanda, who is one of the wives of Miele Kaya is the one who is going to interfere. But the Department of Traditional Affairs has said they will listen to all the groups and then after news has been something to will sit and discuss who, which group is legitimate and who out of these three names that they were putting forward is the rightful person to take over. Well, thank you very much, Zimkita. Later we will be talking to Miele Kaya, to uh, Chief of... Uh, Sorry, Chief Patagile Olomisa, uh, who is at that meeting at uh, Mumbai, a great place that is going to make a decision as to who is actually going to be the acting king. I'm not sure whether it's an acting king or a regent, because there are those who, when you stay, when you, when you are holding on for somebody else who is too young to come in, you become a regent. I don't know when the king is in jail, what happens. If you want to join us today's discussion, please call us on 011-714-5497 or 5498 or tweet us at or email your thoughts about this program and many others to write and records at sabc.ca.za. Stay with us.
Africa's tech scene is constantly coming up with innovative ways to answer some of the continent's problems. We source content from social media, uh, from mobile, our mobile apps, from our website. And as people move from phone calls to data, companies have to switch what they offer. People expect to get higher speeds, better quality broadband for less. On Network, we have information on Africa's technology and social media scene. That's Network with me, Pumelele Zondi, every Sunday at 9 p.m. Central African time, only on SABC News. Welcome back. And as we heard there, ladies and gentlemen, we are from Zimkita. What transpired up to this time of, on this case? But there is a, a view here in the light of this case. Let me come to you, Paul. There's a view in light of this case that there's a view that customary law has been seen as a stepchild of the Roman Dutch law. That's correct. And in fact, that view was shared by the Constitutional Court itself. In the Makwanyane judgment, uh, if you may recall, Judge uh, Albi Sachs made exactly that point that uh, he, he remarked that uh, there was not a lot of uh, reliance placed on customary uh, law. And he basically lamented that state of affairs and wanted that changed. What are the actual issues, Menzi, that, that point to customary law in this case? Well, the, the, the simplest one is the fact that you're dealing with a monarch. We're dealing with a king and not an ordinary person. So that already should raise awareness on anyone that is considering the matter, that you are not dealing with a normal situation. In the same way that um, it would be the case if it was a monarch from outside of the Republic of South Africa. There would be some attention of a special kind to this case. And in here, um, none has been, has been forthcoming. Um, the discussions that have taken place have been really around the regurgitation of what the constitution says and little about what the facts were on the ground that led to the case that it is and what you have um, is a monarch that is charged um, in a in a legal west in a western legal way on facts that um, in a customary law setting or practice um, are, are similar but in that particular practice, the actions are not illegal. Uh, for example, if you look at the case of arson, um, in a Western way, the burning of the rendezvous uh, is arson because anybody that burns a property commits an arson. That's how the law is defined. But um, in a traditional setting uh, where there are no facilities to detain suspects or to detain people that have committed crimes against society, society in the traditional way tends to impose a sentence of banishment which effectively is an eviction. And how that eviction gets carried out is that somebody gets chased away physically to go and live in another village that can accept him or her, uh, failing which um, your property gets, gets demolished so that you don't return. So in this case, that's exactly what the king did. Um, he implemented a decision that society had already taken uh, against a person who became recalcitrant and kept coming back and running away. And the ultimate recourse was that, well, in order to prevent this person from coming back, who was a hoodlum, by the way, not a clean living citizen, it was a hoodlum, um, was committing serious crimes of rape amongst others. The decision was that his property therefore must be bent. And it's interesting how that was carried out. The king was present. All the valuable parts of that property were removed from the property so that there's no damage to valuable parts of the property and that's how it was demolished. Now that's an, an eviction process, a banishment process that in the normal system you'd have by way of having somebody detained pending a bail application or pending sentence. Krasha, for example, has been evicted from society and banished from society. That's acceptable because this system has the means of doing it. A traditional system has no means of doing it. And so th there is that conflict there. Um, and the lack of recognition of that system is what raises um, a big issue of concern. Brenda, many people who are protagonists of the rule of law are yes. saying uh, everyone is equal before the law and has a right to equal protection. But I'd like to add they leave out this part is a right to equal protection and a benefit of the law. Yes. 
Um, uh, Dumila, I want to uh, depart slightly from what Advocate Similani has said and, and touch upon the supremacy clause because the problem here is the status of our constitution. We, we live in a constitutional democracy and a situation where uh, the king can do no wrong, and I see that has been cited locally, is in itself an English common law maxim. It has its origins in, in English law. What we need to do here is it is very important for customary law, for indigenous legal principles to be absorbed and to be relied on by our courts. But we must remember that at the time of the commission of these acts by the king, he was controlled by the Black Administration Act of 1947. Corporal punishment and arson were prohibited even in terms of that act. So whilst traditional courts were there, they could mete out punishment and they could adjudicate upon certain disputes and those disputes did not include instances of rape and murder for argument's sake. Paul, Mr. Gouverneur, I picked up uh something in the constitution that, that the reference to there's only two paragraph in reference to traditional lead traditional authority and there's one sentence ref, with reference to customary law in the absence of uh, enabling legislation how how are these going to be carried out well with, re with respect to the king if one looks at the allegations uh, involving the king the question is whether or not the king, at the time he acted, was presiding over a customary court. If he was, then all the immunities that normally will inure to um, presiding officers in any court would then um, be applicable to the king. Remember that the Constitutional Court itself said in the in re certification uh, case. Uh, it specifically recognized that the word courts in the Constitution would also apply to customary courts. So, But how do you do that? It means, it, it, for instance, with every other aspect, every other section in the Constitution, there's enabling legislation. I know of no enabling legislation with regard to customary law except for the traditional courts bill that is still before Parliament in the uh, National Framework Act that deals with traditional leadership that is also still in, in Parliament. Right. But yes. coming to the, to the um, case of the King again, 1995, one of the constitutional principles that were outlined that were supposed to be included in the final constitution was that the law that was in effect then continued to be in effect. So if we stay faithful to those facts, as they relate to the king. The uh, Black Administration Act that you've cited, that you've correctly cited, was applicable. And it's not true that corporal punishment uh, could, uh, could not be administered by, by chiefs. In fact, it could be. In this country, we did not abolish corporal punishment until 1997, two years after the king committed the alleged uh, uh, corporal punishment. There were magistrates who were meeting out punishments of corporal punishment to uh, offenders. Nobody has put them in jail. Nobody has put them on trial for that. Yes, but I want Julia, to say something. I, 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 I just quickly need to touch upon two issues. Yes, it is true that the Constitutional Court held that courts include traditional courts. But jurisdiction is of critical importance. A magistrate's court, a high court, the Supreme Court of Appeal, the Constitutional Court, and traditional courts have a specific jurisdiction. And that jurisdiction, in, in the case of traditional courts, did not cover certain offenses. Secondly, Black Administration Act, I speak under correction, either Section 10 or Section 20 explicitly excluded corporal punishment as a, a, a method of, of punishment to be meted out by traditional courts. Yes, in all other courts, that was actually acceptable, but not for the traditional courts. Well, let's hear it. Let's now take a break. And when we return, you would like to join us, you can talk to us 
Uh, you can call us on 0117 or 5498. Or tweet us at Rise and Recourse or email your thoughts to Rise and Recourse at sfuc.co.za. Don't go away. We'll be back right after this. Get all the latest news from the SABC's online news services on our website. Breaking news and in-depth coverage of everything from business, sports to politics and lifestyle. Catch the top news clips and watch live streaming of major news events on the SABC News YouTube channel whenever. Stay connected on the SABC News Facebook page and have your say on news that matters to you. And for the latest headlines and live updates from our reporters, follow us on Twitter. SABC Digital News, anytime, anywhere. Welcome back. We'll quickly go down to Mtata and speak to our other reporter who's on the scene at Mumbana Great Plates, Unati Binosa. Unati, good afternoon and welcome to Rice and Recourse. A very good afternoon to you and a warm welcome to all our viewers. Uh, Unati, the meeting is on and uh, what have you heard? Certainly, it is underway. It started um, an hour later than it was scheduled. It was scheduled to start at um, 12 o'clock. It started shortly after 1 o'clock. And I can tell you that it is um, underway, fully underway, and um, the debates are very, very robust. I mean, um, all the chiefs, perhaps not all the chiefs, I mean, uh, those who are pro um, the king are here, uh, the majority of them, and uh, the debate is very, very heated. And um, the names that have come up um, in these discussions, we heard about as Nati, who is the son of the king, and of course we heard about Ngosikazi Umama, Ngosikazi Gaba Ubuyelekaya, who has been also touted as a possible king. So the debate is mainly between those two people. But I can tell you that um, perhaps uh, within 15, 30 minutes after the meeting started, uh, we saw the police rushing inside and the hall behind me where the meeting is taking place. And apparently the, the debate got a bit too heated. Uh, for, for their liking and for the comfort of some. And we saw some people walking out um, after there was some argument. But things have um, gotten back on track now and uh, the discussions are well underway. And um, the police are keeping a very, very close eye to the developments inside here. <laughs> there are those who are standing outside ensuring that um, everything goes uh, peacefully. The debates are robust, but uh, they, they perhaps um, tempers do not go beyond um, what um, is required in this debate. Uh, but uh, we do expect that uh, perhaps um, when the meeting is done, we will hear who they have decided um, should be the king, rather it should be the acting king. Because they've made it very, very clear that uh, they are not looking for someone to replace uh, King Buyelekaya Dalingyebo. However, they are looking for someone who's going to act, who's going to occupy this position on an acting capacity so that when the king comes back, he takes over the reins um, and continues as king. Um, and uh, of course, like I said, the two, the, the two names that have been put forward now is that of Azanati, which the king, I mean, I, I was here uh, when the king said he had nominated uh, Azanati to take over the reins. However, we're told that uh, afterwards, shortly before he went um, to serve his jail term, uh, he had changed his mind and decided to 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 nominate his wife um, to, to, to occupy the, the position, of course, on acting capacity. Uh, so it's, the ball is on Abba Tembo's court now to decide which of the two uh, will take over the reins. I but what I can say, tell you that it, it, it is an open meeting. The public Unati. is allowed the, inside there, and we saw a lot of people walking in there. I heard you say that some of the key, some of the chiefs that are present, are those that are pro the king. Are you saying to me there is a division? Are the kings who are not there the, the, between these two houses? I know them. Tikaga house is divided into two. 
certainly there are those um, that are not on good terms who are not seeing eye to eye with the king and they are mainly led by um, Chief Daludumo Mdikaka and of course he, he is not here and those he is leading they, they, they are also not part of this meeting here so of course there are those divisions um, in, within this house uh, but uh, those who are here are mainly those who are pro the king and they include the siblings um, of the king and the close relatives we saw uh, his elder sister is part of this meeting we saw two of his sisters rather are part of this meeting and of course we saw his brothers um, being part of this meeting also as a is also part of this meeting and the wife that has been nominated to take over is also uh, part of this meeting but those who are not in good terms with the king those who are not seeing eye to eye with the king are not part of this meeting unfortunately Unati, I'm told you are going to come back to us later with Ngozi Patikile Olomis. I hope you're still going to do that for us. Certainly, that is the plan. I've spoken to him. He has agreed to come out and speak to us. He is, of course, part of this meeting as well. He's a well-respected chief, rather, king, chief around here. He's part of the Abatembo dynasty, and he's here to make his contribution uh, in this robust debate that is taking place here. He's scheduled to speak to us. We do expect that um, he'll, be, he'll be joining us in no time. In fact, I can see him outside there. Uh, I'm not sure if you can just give me the times as to when you are interested to come back to us. He's on stand by and ready to speak to us. Okay, now we'll come back to, to you shortly. Just wait for us. We'll, they will speak to you and tell you when you're coming. To, come, when we'll be coming back to you when you speak to Gosi Patigilo Lomisa. Unati Bimose there from Umtata, from the Umtata group. There's a question I wanted to ask quickly. How is this, for instance, it looks like the majority of the Abatembu chiefs are in this meeting. Remember, uh, Dumile, that the Act specifies that immediately that certificate is withdrawn. The royal family, as a collective, it doesn't matter how many camps there can be, the royal family, as a collective, are the ones who are supposed to come together and nominate a, 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 a person and send that um, name forward, whether to um, the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, as well as to, to the President. I think that, uh, if, I, if I'm not, if I stand corrected here, that the, the nomination has to go to the provincial department of yes. COCTA yes. before it goes to it, national. Yes, that's why I'm saying it, it goes to cooperative governance and ultimately then to uh, the president. Whilst we're waiting for Unati to come back to us, uh, Advocate Similane, in accordance with section 39, subsection 2 of the Bill of Rights, when interpreting any legislation, it says, when interpreting any legislation, yeah. And when developing common law or customary law, every court must promote the spirit of the Bill of Rights. Yeah. Did the Constitutional Court miss an opportunity here? All the courts missed an opportunity. In fact, uh, it's not only the judiciary that missed an opportunity. The executive has missed an opportunity. The tragedy here, which is why we have the mess that is uh, reported taking place in the, in the great palace there, um, is that we now have a kingdom. Um, I'm not sure if we're the first ones in Africa or in the world. We have a kingdom that is in disarray because um, the, the, the people of this country collectively, because we're all responsible, have not ensured that there are appropriate measures uh, to look after all our kingdoms uh, in equal measure. I mean, the first thing in the Constitution is that in the whole of the Constitution, only two sections are dedicated to the House of Traditional Leadership just two sections in the whole chapter. That in itself is a problem. The enabling legislation, the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act um, is full of, um, of holes in it. It doesn't adequately provide for the system of leadership when these are supposed to coexist. So just hold it there. Yeah. We'll come back to the issues of the Constitution. Uh, Unati is now with Ngosi Patigilo Olomisa. Unati, you can take it from here and speak to Ngosi Patigilo Olomisa. You can probably give us an overview of what has been taking place inside that room where they are holding the meeting. Thank you very much, say Indeed, we have been joined by um, Deputy Minister of Labour, and of course, he's one of Inkosi Zabatembo. He's been part of this meeting, and uh, he has had some of the privileges, unfortunately, we never had uh, of being part of that meeting. So I'm sure he's going to be able to let us in um, on what has been happening inside there, and of course, the significance uh, of this meeting. Let us now speak to Nkosi Paragile Olomisa. Tadasi Gulela Kolongo Bote Wazdi Nawa Bayi Malenye Yale Yolsasazo. But very briefly, 
tell me, what is the significance of um, this meeting inside here? Well, the first place, the king is in jail. His attempts at uh, avoiding getting to jail having failed so far. Now it's proper that uh, the royal family and the royal clan informs the traditional leaders of the temple as well as the temple that the king is in jail and therefore what has to be done. What has to be done now is to consider the resolution that has been taken in various meetings involving the kings, starting with the royal family itself, going to the f- meeting of the Lomo royal clan, coming up with a meeting uh, of the traditional leaders and then the temple themselves, where the king uh, told us that uh, uh, his son, Azenati, his little son, is going to be acting in his uh, place while he is away. We should be coming to meet here, therefore, to talk about the implementation of that decision now that uh, the eventuality has arisen. But we also hear that um, he had apparently made a U-turn on that deci- decision and decided to nominate uh, his wife um, to act instead. And I hear that uh, a lot of debate is around those two names. Well, the institution of traditional leadership is an institution of principles, policies and customs. And now, the only decision that has been conveyed to us through the proper channel is that that is the one that I mentioned earlier, which was endorsed by the king himself publicly on several platforms that uh, Azenati is going to act in his uh, steed while he's away. That is what we are going to ensure that uh, it happens. His views that came subsequent to that should have been channeled through the proper channels, just as this one was. Now that that didn't happen, that falls away. So a lot of people would be asking the significance and the point of um, this meeting then, if um, the general feeling is that uh, as an artist should take over the, the reins. Of course, the, the general feeling is that uh, the resolution that was taken previously must be adhered to. And that uh, resolution was blessed by the king himself in the presence of Abatim and their representatives. So there's no reason why then it should be deviated from. Otherwise, it would be a people who are unprincipled, who are indecisive, who don't know exactly what it is that they are supposed to be doing. Right. Before I let you go, tell me, how, is the, how are the debates like inside? I mean, we are outside, um, but we hear that um, they, they, seem, they are seemingly very, very robust. Well, the chairman of the meeting did say that there will be a press briefing after the discussions. But of course, the people uh, accept the decision that was taken. Uh, but at the same time, they are angry, annoyed at the fact that uh, the king uh, is in jail. They see it as an embarrassment to them as a people. And uh, they are calling upon government to do something to ensure that uh, the position is reversed and that the, the dignity of the institution of traditional leadership, particularly that of the Tembu Kingdom, is restored. All right. is, are there any steps that you are going to take towards ensuring that uh, goal? Well, uh, we are constantly um, having discussions with uh, lawyers, people who are trained in law. But of course, you will appreciate the fact that uh, traditional, I mean, African law is not known by any of the lawyers we have in the country because it has never been taught properly in any of our universities. The judges don't know our customary law. The lawyers themselves don't know it, prosecutors. It's only the traditional leaders who are in a position uh, to understand uh, our custom as uh, it was, um, what do you call, excluded from recognition properly by the Constitution. But what we believe ought to be done now that the Constitutional Court has um, abdicated its responsibility to give direction on this matter, the Judicial Services Commission, the one that appoints judges, ought to be approached by our lawyers on behalf of us as the, as the Tembo people, that uh, they uh, call upon the Constitutional Court to review its decision, not to want to listen to the application for leave to appeal the decision of the Supreme Court, so that they do their work, which is to interpret the Constitution properly. The Constitution does give recognition, even though it does not protect uh, the institution of traditional leadership, including our role as judicial officers. So now that uh, that court, the ultimate court in land has failed, 
the people who appoint it should be uh, given the responsibility to look into the matter uh, with a view to getting the Constitutional Court to, as I say, setting aside its original decision and allow, uh, and allow itself to apply its mind to this matter. I understand that you have to rush back into the meeting, but have you received any update? Have you perhaps received any update on his health? Well, yes, we were told that uh, he is still in hospital, but now he is uh, taking his meals because uh, he had been he had, uh, he had earlier on embarked on a hunger strike, uh, continuing to protest against the decision that he must go to jail. But uh, we've been made to understand that he's stabilizing now, he's uh, having his meals. And hopefully, uh, well, I can't say hopefully he'll go back to jail, but, uh, uh, well, his, his health at least will be in a good position. Thank you very much. All right. Well, that was Ngosi Paragile Wolomisa, one of the chiefs um, of Abatembu. He was speaking to us about what is happening inside here and the, uh, and the general feeling among Abatembu. And seemingly, um, the general feeling is that um, as a Nati, he's more likely to be the one who will emerge um, as the one who will be the acting king while um, his dad is um, serving the 12-year sentence. And what I can tell you is that inside there, there are a lot of people. Uh, we've seen political parties putting their political differences aside. We've seen uh, people in AIDS t-shirts and we've seen people in EFF t-shirts um, all calling for the release of the king and them um, showing their support and their sympathy uh, towards the plight of the king and of course uh, the plight of the Tembo nation and uh, they are hopeful that uh, perhaps uh, they will be able to find common grounds and ensure that uh, there is stability within the Tembo nation. With that uh, allow us to hand back to you guys in Auckland Park. Thank you very much Unati for your contribution today as you heard what Gosi Patikil Olomisa said there you see there seems to be uh, no movement from what the king had said earlier even though it is indicated that he changed his stance later and said probably his wife should take over and that came after some some people said Azunati cannot be the person who becomes the acting king don't go away we'll be back right after this Welcome back to your rights and recourse as we discuss the issues of the, the dichotomy between constitutional, our constitution as the Republic of South Africa and customary law. So, Mr. Ngobioni, I want to go back to something. I don't know, we all heard what Ngozi Patigelo Olomisa said there. In fact, he made a, a reference to they have lawyers in that meeting, but he's lamenting the fact that many of our lawyers do not know customary law. And uh, you even said even the judges don't know customer law. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And that's what was perverse about this case because you had even the judge who presided over the case. He cites the new constitution saying that the king's actions violated the new constitution. But we know that, that constitu this constitution was not in effect at the time the king acted. When a constitutional issue was raised, because I, I believe that the king's lawyers did raise the issue uh, that the king was acting in his capacity as the king. He was exercising both civil and criminal jurisdiction, which is recognized in the law. The judge dismissed all of that. That again speaks to the question of relegating African law, uh, basically denigrating it, treating it as if it's not important, despite what the constitution says. 
African Similane, there is a view coming out of that meeting, or a view coming out uh, in, 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 in this whole issue, that the, this case, in order to be resolved, uh, in other words, it will have to go back to the Constitutional Court, but apparently, who can take this case back to the Constitutional Court? Well, an, a number of people can take the case back to the Constitutional Court, and correctly so, in fact, uh, it should go back to the Constitutional Court for decision. The question then would be whether or not the current judges are competent to deal with the matter they already dismissed so uh, in a manner that they did without even hearing it. And with that, the question is whether or not in themselves they violated the Constitution by not giving a hearing to the person who had come before them uh, for a hearing as required by the Constitution. But His Majesty himself can go back uh, to court. Um, well, it, it could happen in two ways. The first way is to, could be, to approach the Chief Justice as the head of the court and the head of the, of the judiciary to, to have an audience with him administratively because the other role of the Chief Justice is to deal with issues of the administration of justice by the courts and not only to sit and hear and be part of judges that consider a case. So it can be approached separately by everyone. The executive can do it for clarity. The House of Traditional Leaders, Contra Lesa, can do it for clarity. Anybody, any, any amicus courier individual, any person who is part of Abatembu can do it to ask for this clarity. Because remember, whilst the individual affected here is His Majesty the King, it is the whole institution of a nation. It is the whole nation which has been dealt harm. So all the persons who regard themselves and are correctly abatembu are individually in their persons individually and as a collective affected by this. So any one of them can go to the constitutional court and, and petition the Chief Justice to, for an audience and guidance on how to take this particular metaphor. Brenda, yeah. we could have an interesting case law here. Um, I, I, I would actually say that a, the person that I feel could actually take this matter forward, and it's sad that Contra Lesa hasn't. Ever, ever since the Constitution came into being, they haven't challenged the status of customary and indigenous law within this constitutional framework. Is it, is it though Contralesa should be doing that? Because in my view, Contralesa is an NGO, probably the House of Traditional Leaders. Yes, if, even the House of Traditional Leaders, I'm saying all of them have a very, very important role to play. But the Minister of Justice, for argument's sake, could approach the Constitutional Court and say, we need this matter resolved. Remember, the, the jurisdiction of the Constitutional Court has basically been expanded. They decide on novel constitutional issues or any other issue of importance. And it's critical. This, this matter is a very, very important issue. In, in my opinion, the, the king's options now of going back to court are, are done and dusted. We're not going to have a, a revisitation of that trial. But the Minister of Justice could go ahead. And the king has at his disposal, Section 82 of the Correctional Services Act says that the president can remit any part or the whole of a sentence of someone who is currently uh, serving a, an incarceration term. And, and this is what they ought to be considering. Ask the president either to remit the sentence or to convert that sentence into correctional supervision in order to resolve the crisis. And Section 82 of the Correctional Services Act doesn't affect the president's powers to pardon the king. Because if the king is not pardoned for those convictions and he received a sentence of more than 12 months it's not about being a caretaker king in his place he can never go back after a conviction plus a sentence of, of, of 12 years. And this is what uh, the Abatembu should be doing and other effective, uh, affected people in the community by recommending a presidential pardon in terms of Section 3 to 5, not the 3 to 7 application, which in my view was incorrectly uh, brought and had no basis uh, at all in law. Mr. Gobeni, uh Chief Particular Olomisa used some very strong words, uh, like the Constitutional Court abdicated its responsibility. I, th I think he's correct. I mean, the Constitutional Court was faced with several constitutional issues. And in state, it turned a blind eye to all of them and dismissed the King's uh, uh, case. The first issue that they should have dealt with was 
is whether or not a king or a chief who, who's acting in his capacity as a presiding officer at a court, whether the king can be subject to criminal prosecution for decisions he makes in that capacity. Even if he acted in excess of his jurisdiction, there are appeal mechanisms. He could have, these decisions could have been reviewed in the courts. You don't simply solve that problem by throwing him in jail. So as it stands right now, and I believe uh, uh, Chief uh, Holomisa's uh, concerns are very valid, as it stands right now, all the chiefs should be very scared that any disgruntled litigant could simply uh, solve whatever case they have by simply running to the police and filing a criminal case against the chief. Well, yes, I, as you say, let's, let's, I, I, I have that question for as I said, could this decision by the courts be seen as really applying the rule of law and it can be seen as a precedent and who could be next? But let's take this call from Nyameko in the Eastern Cape. Nyameko, good afternoon and welcome to Rise and Recourse. Molenda, <laughs> the that goes yeah. Nyamego. Nyamego is saying that this whole issue is about patronage. Yeah. If the king was, was, was patronaging somebody or a, a certain party, he would not have been in this problem. But I think this case I comes a long way. I, 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 I think yeah, that's, that's, that's a, a sad, that's, that's incorrect. And they've mentioned the fact that um, the king changed. If you look at 2009, he was not a member of the DA then, mm. and he was convicted irrespective of the fact that he was a member of the ANC. And these are appeal processes which have taken this long, and there was no e executive intervention in any of those processes. In some cases, I'm yes. told, they, they were delayed by himself. Yes, that's what the Supreme Court of Appeal said, that the dilatoriness was largely due um, uh, to, to the king himself. Oh, but that, that, that is incorrect. That, that actually is incorrect that it, the king was responsible for the delays. First of all, he went to legal aid and they denied him legal assistance. So the king went from one lawyer to another. And what the problem that we were just talking about, that our lawyers are also not completely competent when it comes to the matters of customary law. So that's, that was part of the, the, the problem. The, those were the hurdles that the king had to deal with. You cannot just blame everything on him and say, well, he was responsible for 10 year delay in a trial. It's not true. Uh, Advocate Simulado, you want to say something quickly? Yeah, I, I think the, the comment, um, apparently is correct, is, is, not, uh, is, is not the right one, but it's not, a, it's not lacking of validity in the sense that um, that's the perception held by a majority of people and it should be attended to. The majority of South Africans live in the rural areas. All the, the majority of the black people that live in urban areas, every December go back to a Makaya and go and subject themselves to the ways of, uh, of those traditional communities and subject themselves to that. So this case has created a big problem, you know, short of basically putting the institution of traditional leadership into, into disarray. What, what is at issue here is that at the level of the executive and parliament, it is a fundamental problem that there are no very clear protocols about how to deal with a monarch. For example, the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act deals with senior traditional leaders, traditional leaders. It doesn't specifically give a clear framework about how to deal with a king or a queen. Those are different people hierarchically and in all material respect. So there is a very big lacuna which needs to be closed as soon as possible to avoid um, these kind of things going forward. The miscarriage of justice here was how the police investigated the matter how many accomplices were turned into witnesses against one person. Because remember, the king doesn't go around by himself. He's always got a group of people around him. And the community, which was effectively on the fact a mob justice situation, brought these criminals before the king 
after they've badly beaten them. And the king asked them to say, what must I do with this person or these people that you have done these things to? And the people said, you as the final authority, you deal with them as the kumkani and so forth and so forth. And one of the things you must do is to lash them as an act of demonstrating as a king that you are on the side of the community vis-a-vis -vis what these people did. And that's what the king did. Let's take this call quick. I wanted Brenda to, to come in there, sure. especially on the issue of uh, the, 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 the evidence that was laid in court. Uh, Parky from Cape Town, good afternoon and welcome to Rise and Recourse. Bob Mateza, um, and with my learned friends um, in the studio, Namige, let me throw in my two cents as if we are all um, advocates submitting heads of judgments to you, say, our <laughs> honorable judge. Bob Mateza, I mean, I just need to know, what if this case drags and for a longer period, almost for forever, since we know forever is a very long time, are we seeing the constitutional prerogative taking stand, meaning now coming into this case saying, no, yes, now the Constitution is the Supreme Court um, law of the country taking a stand, saying one, two, three. I just want to know. So thank you so much for taking my call. Well, I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Parky. I think Parky raises a point, and uh, we, we dealt with that. For instance, Gosi Patigel Olomisa raised the issue of uh, going to the JSC, and Advocate Similana raised the issue of petitioning the Chief Justice. Yes, it, it, it is, and I, I just think I like Parky's approach to this whole thing, because we need to clarify what is in, in countries like Belgium and Spain, that that position that a king can do no harm. How do we then incorporate that in a country which has a constitutional democracy? Because you must remember that countries where a king cannot be uh, uh, prosecuted are, are countries that are constitutional monarchies. South Africa is a constitutional democracy. So how do we then marry the two and say we are going to bring in uh, sovereign immunity because that is what it basically is. So is it a sovereign immunity that says the king can do no harm or is it one that says even if a king does harm, um, the king cannot be prosecuted, um, etc. But these are debates which are, are critical and which need to take place. The, uh, the, the, point, the, point, okay. the, the point is that, uh, Brenda is absolutely correct, so the point is that the king should never be, or a king should never be in a position where they have to administer physically themselves any justice to anybody. There should be protocols and administrative processes in place that shield them from this. So for example, how, how does an individual access a king? You, normally you pass 10, 15 people before you actually get that far. So the, what, what is missing in the law is, is a law that gives provisions about the minimum support, administrative support that ministers have, that directors general have in government, that the president has and the deputy and so forth and so forth. Traditional, senior traditional leaders and monarchs in particular do not have that. In fact, the only monarch that has all the necessary, uh, at least the minimum necessary protections is His Majesty Silo, uh, King Kudul Zolitini, who is constitutionally uh, provided for in the constitution of a particular province. So he could never be uh, in a position where he has to personally do anything. He can Let's take this conflict. last call from Schengen in Cape Town. Schengen, good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recourse. Yes, good afternoon. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. And thanks to everyone who's there at the studio. Thank you. My question is very, is very brief. I do not understand why a customary issue is now subjected to the interpretations of the court system, which is largely based on Roman and Dutch law. In my humble opinion, is it not an admission that the character of our customary laws is subservient to that of the Roman Dutch system? Are we not supposed to argue, and of course, under the Constitution, to argue for a system which is made of judges who would interpret our customary law in terms of our values? Because some are even arguing about even our own Constitution, they say, is based on a Canadian value system. Therefore, if we argue for, for something which is similar to that, probably the quagmire that we find ourselves in now would have been resolved much earlier. Thank you. I like the, your point. Well, I want you to respond. Mr. Mubeni, I want you to respond to what uh, Schenger is raising. There. Yes, and he's very correct. Uh, our problem right now is that mm. the, what is lacking is judicial competence. 
here and there you have judges who issue very well thought out, well written uh, judgments that touch on or that explain some aspects of customary law. But the majority of the people we appoint on the, on the bench, uh, unless if they went to some of the former Bush universities, they will not have studied any African law. So when the Constitution says it recognizes the um, status and role of traditional leaders, and you have a case involving a traditional leader in those courts, there's, you simply have a judge who has no clue as to what to do in that case. Brenda, there's yes. something else that's, that, that's come up this week, during the week, I think on Thursday, that came up in that uh, uh, Mr. Zah Zahir Omar raising mm. the issue that they are going to take Minister Masuta's decision regarding the, the, the petition which they made to Minister Masuta on review. Well, no appeal or review lies against the decision either of the president or of the court or of, of the minister in terms of section uh, three to seven. And as I said earlier, I think that is misguided. The, the other confusion that I think is important to clarify is that there are crimes and delicts even at indigenous law because many people are trying to say, are you trying to tell us that arson and etc and murder are acceptable in customary law absolutely not well gentlemen ladies and gentlemen we are not going to be able to solve the thing here we've got a solution probably one of the things that were mentioned by advocate Similane or the one that was mentioned by uh, chief particular Lomisa will be one that will prevail at the end of the day I am tempted to close with a stanza from a poem by Tosa national praise singer Eskain Kai paying tribute to King Hinzao presided over Ijala Lamawele, the trial of the teens. Kwati wake lomdu umdu egazi, kwati walomdu ingonyana ingonyana yoshanga, kwati walomdu magachoche lulundu, aze ati ena tobe lukamata, apu kuya kuti kufelubi imi tetu nezmi selo, aya kuti aku zikwaegna kunga lungelelani, kube zizi piti piti, loku pampana kulundu, ibe kukulu kupote, kupampana kumtlaba, haba koka yobo, haba zanga bapela, haba kala za, basa zaula na namshoku, bate ngonge sisu, bate gago mselelo, haba zenzi isi badali we kulondo, Deham. This program is repeated at 5 on Monday morning. Do find us on Twitter and YouTube from all of us here in the studio and the rest of the team. Thank you to our guests and goodbye.